from theoretical physics, locked in a room, just pen and paper and working hard computations, to work in a collaboration and doing detector characterization, and then doing public outreach, education and public outreach, which is something I was not thinking about when I started my career. You can make their appreciation of what they're looking at so much richer by explaining things to them. Now I try to tell all students, really, that they should do outreach, they should talk to the public. So what you see there is the interference of the two light beams. You see that there are those circles and they are vibrating all the time. It's because of the two waves that they sum together, okay? But as soon as you touch it, there is some vibration. As you take somebody to a waterfall. They'll notice that the waterfall is made up of little droplets. It isn't really continuous. Why does that happen? I give tours and I talk to the public and I'll, I'll explain things and I try to break it down. But when you're a physicist, it's almost like they've gotten in there somehow and rewired your brain. And, and you, you say things that are completely obvious to you. The more that I learn, the more and greater appreciation I have for the world around me. And so I guess I could easily you know, move that over to young people. The more opportunities that they have to experience the world around them, the more appreciation that they'll have. And I'll say, did you understand that? And she'll be like, not really. <laughs> With the birth of the universe, commonly known as the Big Bang, quantum fluctuations produce the first gravitational waves. Even now, 13 billion years later, they permeate the whole universe. 380,000 years after the birth of the universe, photons decoupled from matter and began traveling free. This is what we call the cosmic microwave background, or CMB. Early gravitational waves polarize that background that we measure with sensitive earthbound and orbiting instruments. At the center of the galaxies, there are supermassive black holes, sometimes reaching a billion times the mass of our own sun. When two of these black holes orbit around each other, they produce gravitational waves with wavelengths of tens of light years. Over time, black holes get closer to each other, finally merging into a single larger black hole. This event produces gravitational waves of a shorter wavelength measured in astronomical units, the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Space-borne experiments were designed to detect these gravitational waves with satellites connected by lasers. Pulsars generate highly regular radio beacons. 
When gravitational waves move through our galaxy, they warp space-time, slightly changing the timing of the pulsar beams. We use radio telescopes to measure those small changes. At a much smaller scale, the coalescence of black holes of tens to hundreds of solar masses produce gravitational waves of tens to hundreds of kilometers. Gravitational waves of similar frequencies are produced by binary neutron star systems, supernova explosions, and pulsars. It is this what Advanced LIGO was designed to detect. I'm going to try to show you how an interferometer actually detects gravitational waves. If they are propagating or if they're heading in the direction of this blackboard, uh, they will do along the, let's call this the x-axis, they will stretch the x-axis and space-time in the y-axis will shrink. And a little bit later, do the opposite. And we're going to exploit that property of gravitational waves. That's called the polarization of the wave in this device, which we call the interferometer. It sends out a light beam. And the very first thing it encounters is a beam splitter. It's a device that transmits light, about half the light that hits it, and also reflects light, about half the light that hits it. This beam got reflected from here went up and got reflected inside this jazzy mirror, which is this corner, and comes down to here. And here, it gets reflected back to the source. But another thing that happens to it is it gets transmitted as well. So it comes down like that. But there's an also a line that comes this way. Light hits this thing and also gets reflected. They both get reflected together. And come to a photo detector. Here is the photo detector. And remember what happens with light waves. When they propagate, let's say in this direction, they have electric fields that go up and down. They wiggle with the light wave. There's a wave. This is negative electric fields. That's a positive electric field. That means the electric field points up. Here, the electric field points down. That's all. And the amplitude of this is the size of the electric field. You imagine this whole pattern zipping along to the beam splitter and then zipping up to this mirror and then zipping down and hitting the photo detector. It's the same thing happening along here. That entire pattern moves along, moves up, comes back to the beam splitter and goes down to the photo detector. But this time, it's reflected by the beam splitter that flips this whole thing over, just flips it over. If you have set the thing up properly, maybe this path length is the same as that path length, you can make it so that the photo detector doesn't see any light whatsoever. Now, let's put in the fact that the gravitational wave comes along and stretches one side and shrinks the other. When I add these two, this one and that one, I don't get zeros anymore. Now, there is light hitting the photo detector. And that is the basic idea. A gravitational wave comes along. It destroys that, 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 that difference between the two paths so that we no longer have just zero light, we get light. And so we have converted the gravitational wave into amount, an amount of light that appears at the photo detector. And that is the fundamental idea behind the measure. Joe was a grad student in my lab, and he was a lot smarter than I was. Because I would give him projects to do, and then he would sometimes do them, but then he did them better with another method. So in other words, what would happen You're is... You're confusing me with Peter. No, I'm not confusing me <laughs> with Peter. And so he was always one step smarter than I was. He always did the right things, and I was thinking of crazy things.
that's my introduction to the being father of some things. Okay? You come up with crazy ideas sometimes. Sometimes you come up with good ideas. But not always. <laughs> that, that is not the way I remember it. <laughs> what, what I remember is you're coming, you're coming back from vacation and putting a sheaf of calculations in my mailbox and all the stuff I should have been calculating <laughs> so, 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 that, so that I could keep doing the wrench work without, without, without missing much. I went to see Ray, and this is a, is a classic Ray scene from those days. And in those days, Ray used to smoke a pipe, so he'd sit at his desk, and he had his arms, his legs crossed up on top of the desk, and he was a pipe in his mouth, and he, so I, I told him why I was there. And so he asked me, well, um, uh, what do you know? So I was like, hmm, what kind of question is that? Suddenly I'd just finished my first year of graduate school. I had taken all these amazing physics classes. So I started rattling, well, I just did graduate quantum mechanics, and I finished the stat. And he's like, I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to know what you know how to do. It is rare to find people in any generation who who both are able to build things with their hands um, and and have the um, I guess both the discipline and and the um, and the drive to, to, to keep up with the, the calculations and the math to, to to support it. It suddenly clicked with me so I was like oh well I know how to use a machine shop I've built electronic circuits and he stopped me pretty quickly after that he's like you're okay yeah you can come work with me. There's an old saying that you're sort of doomed to repeat your PhD thesis until you get it right. <laughs> And, and, no. Um, and so, so, Watch out. I'm sorry. You didn't hear me say that. All right. Um, and, and so the first part, the first half of my, of my PhD thesis was a system to isolate the test mass suspension from ground vibration. It used big chunks of metal and, and, and springs. It's just like complete evolution of what we did in Enhanced LIGO. Some of it's the same equipment that Joe's talking about. Originally, it was passive. It was supposed to operate by itself. And uh, now we have sensors, you know, inertial sensors on the platforms and on the floors, basically on all the stages. And then the curse, the curse of the repeat your PhD was removed, and, uh, and I was able to move on. Sounds like I'm repeating your PhD. <laughs> I remember uh, really vividly the moment when he told me, well, we have to make this interferometer that measures displacements of 10 to the minus 18 meters. I mean, I'm not saying Ray's a theorist. He would kill me if he ever heard me saying that, but, but he, 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 he backs up. He backs up his ideas um, with, with, with solid math and calculations. First I thought he was crazy, then I thought this was the most amazing thing, and if I could be part of it, you know, how could I pass up? My thesis was a very small experiment in a small lab with my advisor, with Peter, myself, and one or two other people. And I went to MIT and we were working with prototypes, and, and, but it was still a relatively small group. Yeah. We were, 10, 15 people working in two or three different things, very focused. And then we began working here, and we are more, but we still all talk to each other, but there are larger groups of people working on very sophisticated and difficult instruments, and you need that number of people, but you still need them all talking to each other. So it's, it's evolved in a very different way, not only in technology, but in the way people interact. Yeah, so I help with commissioning, but I guess the one part that people look at me for here is the environmental studies, trying to see if uh, magnetic effects would be limiting to advanced LIGO. But even in that, which I've, I've done a lot on my own, many times I can go to anyone in the lab and complain and say, oh, I don't understand this. And by the time I've explained the problem, even just complaining about it, it's helped me understand and many times I'm so yourself. stuck in my little view that somebody from the outside who maybe doesn't understand even all the details says but why don't you do it like this and you say what am I doing of course I just joined Anna Maria helping her with the PIM stuff installing accelerometers and also help with uh, a two other grad students on suspension like I've been measuring the resonances of uh, quadruple and triple suspensions Every, every piece is an accessory puzzle to every prompt. Like if, they have, if you have one prompt, it's good to have a knowledge of a little, a little bit of everything because you don't know what you're going to need in the future. The way science works is, is, is a collective uh, phenomenon. So you get views from different people and everyone is working together 
um, then uh, you can exchange your ideas that will stand the test of time. Each generation that joins an experiment like this brings its own ideas. And they're generally better than the ideas that came from the beginning. And that's what you want to be looking for. In other words, you don't want to necessarily look for a derivative of some grand idea that was started by some old guy. You want to see how the, what the idea kept growing and got better and better with each set of people who worked on it. And that's something you're going to find out in all the experiments, that if you look at other experiments, that happened. So yes, I'm very pleased that this thing got built, but it's, it's the work of a lot of other people, and it's the work of the many generations that followed. blessed to work with a wonderful group of people that quite a few of them have been with me for 19 years. There's quite a few of us who've been here for a long time and I wake up every day knowing that I'm going to be working with this group of people that that propel me to ask questions every day, that invigorate me to learn something. To me science in general, not just physics or LIGO, seems to be the one place where it does not matter. It does not matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what gender, what race, what ethnicity, whatever. What you believe, how you dress, which is maybe why we're all, <laughs> we all look like bums. <laughs> but um, whatever comes out of your mouth, that's all that matters. And what you do is all that matters. I wasn't just looking for a job. I wanted something challenging and interesting. I, I still think lag is challenging and interesting. And you know, there's there are not many uh, things you can do in science uh, which, you know, which are comparable to lag. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is beautiful anyway, <laughs> in my opinion. I look at science as a way of trying to explain what the universe has in it, and that should make people feel more at home with where they are. And it isn't necessary that it's utilitarian, but uh, you know that it's going to make anything better for them. But that it gives them something to to think about, and uh, it makes life more interesting. But you can see things in it, patterns that you wouldn't you recognize them, but you don't know what they're about. And it, it, it enriches your experience. To me, that's the most successful thing that scientists do. typical science center, you'll connect a particular exhibit to an experience happening in real life. And people will do that naturally. Here, we want to take that and, and, and blow it up to a whole nother level. How does that relate to the science experiment going on? And what we're really talking about is stuff that's far outside our, our Earth. But utilizing science concepts that are here on Earth, like our, our mirrors are pendulums. You ever hang a, a necklace on your neck, you've got a pendulum. It's probably less important that you know the period of the pendulum. It's more important that you know how to investigate the period of the pendulum. It's more important that you learn how to start doing things for yourself and start testing things. And don't rely on, 
on just information you found somewhere. And then hit the answer when you uh, think you know. I don't know, chat. It's always in the middle. When you're standing here listening to it and you cuff up one ear, it's like it's coming from the sides. You don't hear it from the middle. Working at LIGO, we really have just the best of both worlds. We, we, we see the students once a year, and if we only see them once a year, it's so easy to motivate them. It's the classroom teacher who has the students for 180 days. That's the challenge. So that's on you all the time, because you don't feel it. We're all classroom teachers. We've had a lot of experience. Plus, we, we get a lot of mentoring from the Exploratorium. And as the universe expands, so does the light. So it starts out orange, and it travels, and now it's a little bit longer. What color light has a longer wavelength than orange? Red. Red. It expands so that the light is a thousand times longer than when it left. The orange light that left is now microwave radiation. When students come, they'll say, oh yeah, my teacher has this in the classroom. So we know that something that they've come here and built is actually used in the classroom to inspire students. The gauge of the wire, the thickness of the wire. It's a wonderful way for teachers to make some of the science in terms of something that they can understand, they can relate to. You get two young people talking about what's happening at this exhibit. And I know that students go home and they talk to their parents and they bring their parents back here. So I know that it's changed the conversation with their parents. And it does open their eyes and it, it, it allows them to see that there are many ways to look at the world, but the best one is to observe the world around you and to try to figure out what's going on. Students come in and it's just like total chaos. They're running everywhere. They have no clue that they're in this fabulous learning center. They just see toys everywhere. After about 15 or 20 minutes, they start breaking up from their little groups and you see them going to different exhibits and spending time just exploring all by themselves. And it is, it's, it's a very cool thing to watch. Then the next step is, come over here. This is so cool. You've got to see this. And they start calling their friends over, or they come get one of us, or they grab their teacher. And, and that, that is what this center is about. I think it was just the chemistry as far as, you know, the way that the colors was running and mixing together. How the bubbles would extend and contract with your body and the different way you mix it did on you. I didn't know bubbles had all those kind of colors. I thought it was just clear, to be honest, but it's, it's beautiful. So right now there are people who believe we shouldn't be teaching science in school. They, they really think that requiring two to three years of high school science is wrong. I want people to actually try and understand the universe better, make better sense of it, have better physical intuition. You get people understanding, really understanding the world better. The conceit is that maybe they'll start making better overall decisions, period. As scientists, that curiosity is, is always there. What we've always tried to do is, is learn more about our surroundings and our environment. We always tell them, don't ever quit asking what if or why. You always ask those questions. I think that's what a scientist is anyway. It's just a, it's a young person in a big person body that just never quits asking why. And I went down to the Observe a tree.